Well, good morning, Southside. Special thank you to Logan Harney for preaching last Sunday while I was out with my son's wedding and just grateful for all that he did to bless us last week. He's in Mexico this morning with Nick and Jackie and Shannon and Lydia, so continue to be lifting up that ministry there. I just wanted to make one announcement about BBT. Basic Bible training is going to be starting up. It's in your bulletins. Uh, My kids still talk about BBT, so I just, I can't encourage you enough to bring your kids to it, to get out to the neighborhoods, invite other kids, bring them in. They're going to be hearing the gospel, the truth. They're going to go over the believer's armor. So I just uh, encourage you to be a part of that. This morning, we're going to take back up in Paul's epistle to the Romans. So if you'll turn there, we're going to start a new chapter this morning. That is a big deal at Southside Bible Church. So uh, chapter... 10. And I just want you to know, I can see your faces, so if you fall asleep, I'm on it. <laughs> okay, don't, don't start thinking because it's dark. I, I like to do this every week. Taylor, is it possible? to just? I, I like not having the lights. This is kind of cool. So chapter 10, Romans 10, what a rich chapter. And, and we're going to join our hearts together and ask God's blessing upon our minds and hearts as we study this chapter together. I want the unity of spirit and taking the gospel out into the ends of the earth. That will be the focus of this chapter where every person in this church is giving his life for this gospel. Uh, That no one would would be distracted in building their own kingdom and seeking to make much of themselves. This chapter can do that with what we're going to begin looking at. So let's go to our God and pray and ask him to meet us. Father, I come before you and I do thank you for this chapter that you have given to the church, that by your Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, you've given us a perfect word without error that has perfectly revealed your thoughts and your truth. And so, God, we treasure it more than our necessary food. Lord, it it is the words of life, and I pray now as we open them up that you would do just that, Lord, that you would uh, vivify, give life to our souls. Our, our minds, our hearts. Let us be lifted in these beautiful truths that are revealed in it this morning. And so, God, let this be a time of worship. Meet us. Be exalted. Be glorified. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, Romans chapter 8, we, we saw the eternal security of the believer in Jesus Christ, that nothing can separate you from God's love Chapter 9, we looked at then why does God's covenant people, Israel, for the most part, uh, have rejected their Messiah? And in chapter 9, we looked at it from the view of God's sovereignty, and God told us that not all Israel is Israel. That has never been the plan. That was not, uh, he's not failing. He's working things out perfectly for those who have been chosen by God. Then we closed out the chapter looking at man's responsibility in verses 30 through 33, that Israel was not saved because personally they rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. The righteousness that God gives by faith in his son, they rejected and looked to the law and their own efforts and their own works. So God's purpose has not failed, but Israel has failed for this promised blessing that God's been telling them through the history of the world. And they stumbled over the stumbling stone, which is finally named this morning, in 10.4, is Jesus Christ. Christ is the stone that they stumbled over. And so Paul now will continue flushing that idea out in chapter 10. And so this morning, we're going to take up verses 1 through 4. And again, I, I just think this is a synopsis of the whole book of Romans in four verses. So if you are visiting, I can give you what we've studied for three years in 30 minutes. So let's take a look at it. Paul's going to give us three considerations in our response to the gospel. And in verse 1, we're going to look at the prayer burden that we should have. In verses 2 through 3, we're going to look at the perilous error that we must avoid. And then in verse 4, the precious truth that we must embrace that uh, will light this room up perfectly when we look at verse 4. So if you'll look with me in verse 1 of chapter 10, brethren, (coughs) my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is their salvation. And so the number one response to the doctrine of sovereign 
election most often is, well, if that's true, why preach the gospel? Why should we go say anything if God's the one who saves? If God has set this purpose for everything, declaring the end from the beginning, why should we even pray? We're, we're, we're coming to God and he's already set everything in stone. Why pray? Why preach? And yet we look at the way Paul began this discussion. I don't want you to miss this. In chapter 9, 1 through 3, Paul's saying, I've got such a burden for Israel. I wish I could be accursed if they could be saved. There's this zeal and this love and compassion, not just coldness saying, here's the sovereignty of God for the Jewish nation. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, the, 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 you got pieces of bread. The meat is sovereignty. The bread is compassion for the lost. And now 10, 1, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is their salvation. And then again in verses 13 through 15, how are they going to hear without a preacher unless they're sent? And so, brethren, the sovereignty of God in all things does not produce this doctrine called fatalism where we just say it's all decreed by God. I just sit back and do nothing and let him do his thing. Rather, what we're going to see this morning, it produces determination and zeal for the advancement of the kingdom of God. This truth establishes our confidence and our steadfastness. It is why so many missionaries have not quit when their labors appeared to be fruitless because they knew that God has other sheep that are not been brought into the fold. And we know that sovereignty will bring them in. He'll call them. And so they knew that rank idolatry and the devil could not stop the effectual call of God upon the heathen. And so this establishes confidence in God and preaching and praying and going out because God is a God who saves. Sovereignty establishes prayer it establishes preaching, and it establishes a burden for the lost. And so I've, I've always done this. Yeah, I, if you've been here long, you've heard them. But I like this little idea of a plateau. And on the plateau is this biblical balance of what we're shooting for and what we don't want to fall off the cliff. And so I drew this nice little chart in my head. Is on the top of the plateau is that God is sovereign over everything, and man is completely responsible and those are the, the, the balance and the mystery that the Bible reveals that we have to land on top of this. And if you fall off the cliff into fatalism, it's that God's sovereign. He's decreed everything. Just, we don't have to do anything. Just sit back and let him do it. And you fall off the cliff. It's not biblical. And on the other side is this Arminianism that now my will is self-determinative. My will is what's going to determine who's going to be saved and who not. And, and we also looked at open theism, which goes all the way off the cliff of that God doesn't even know the future and he's just working with whatever happens. Those two are falling off the cliff to land on this beautiful spot of a sovereign God with humans who are responsible. That's what we're shooting for here because that is what the Bible reveals. <clears throat> I think I've said it before, R.C. Sproul, he said, if anyone can ever tie those two together, sovereignty and responsibility, I want to publish their book because they're, they're a mystery and you're not going to ever perfectly get those two understood in your mind, this side of glory. But God reveals both, so I, I live into both. And I've, I've learned it's a razor's edge to stay on that, and that's what we'll be looking at this morning. So let's look at Paul's prayer burden then uh, that we should bear. And before I unpack this verse, I just want to start with why then should we pray then if God is sovereign and he decrees the end from the beginning? That's a very fair question. Why should I even pray? I've had a couple of you ask me that in this journey, and so I tell you that is a fair question. But when we come to the scriptures, we see a God who has declared the end from the beginning, and he says, in him we live, move, and exist and have our being. This scripture declares from cover to cover that God is sovereign over all. So why pray if, if we can't change what he's decreed? And we come to the word of God, and it says we should pray. We should uh, not cease to pray without ceasing. 
He urges us to pray. He gives examples of prayers, how God used them throughout the Bible. You can't come out of this word without seeing that God uses prayer and prayers were used to save and change circumstances and protect armies and people. So if our human reasoning or understanding leads us away from prayer, you've missed it. (laughs) You've misunderstood the Bible. So you, Paul's going to finish sovereignty and say, my heart's desire and my prayer is for their salvation. That's where we have to land if we're going to stay in this biblical balance. So if you've fallen off the cliff saying, why pray at all? You're not understanding it and we want to keep working at it because we should be people of prayer. A right understanding of Romans 9 should gird up your prayer life and make us even more dependent on a sovereign God who saves It establishes prayer. So how do I know if I'm getting this? My prayer life is growing. Two things we've seen in Romans. We've seen a lot of things, but just a couple I want to focus on. Adoption. You've been adopted, and now God is for us. And so the God of the universe is your father, and he's for you, and then he's a sovereign father. He he loves to glorify himself by showing mercy and saving. And he uses means to do this. He uses the gospel. He uses people praying and preaching and loving. God uses those things as he gathers his elect from the end of the earth, the east to the west. And so we pray not to change the will of God, but to participate in the will of God. And he has decreed our prayers and using preaching and all of these things, God uses to accomplish his purposes The two are perfectly married. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for the nation I just told you has mostly been hardened and rejecting and stumbling over the stumbling stone. My heart and my desire for them is their salvation. I'm going to keep praying for them and for that. Paul, wait a minute. You're praying for the ones who mock you, they ridicule you, they say all kinds of evil against you, they want to kill you, they've tried several times. Every time you start a church or teaching, they come and disrupt it, they undermine it. Enough's enough. How quick we write people off. Paul, his burden could not be squelched for his kinsmen. He wanted them plugged into the Greek word here, soterion, Salvation. I I want the Jewish race to enter into salvation. I want them to know this gospel. And God, you're free to show mercy to whomever you desire. And my constant prayer is that you would show forth your glory to the Jews. They stumble over Christ. Show them what you showed me on the road to Damascus when I was going to kill the Christians. Show them that. And so we pray, God, that's my desire that they would be saved. God always ordains the means to some goal as well as the ends. He uses means to get to his ends, and we participate in it. God has ordained the prayer necessary for us to pray for them to be saved. Pray and preach that all would come to Jesus Christ and be saved. George Mueller In Bristol, England, the great founder of all those orphanages, in his youth, he had two friends that he began to pray for, and he kept notes on his prayers. And those notes showed that he prayed for them for more than 60 years. One was converted right before his death, and the other became a Christian a few years after his death. And toward the end of his life, before his friend's conversion, someone asked him, why are you still praying for them after such a long time since they've really shown no interest in the gospel? And he said, do you think God would have kept me praying all these years if he did not intend to save them? I pray that Romans 9 would make us a praying people. That's been my burden all week, that we would be a praying people to a sovereign God asking him to save. My heart's desire is for their salvation. We did a memorial service here a couple weeks ago for a grandmother who interceded night and day for her grandchildren. And at that memorial service, they stood up and they testified of the salvation that God had given them. 
Andrew Murray wrote this. He said, intercession is when a man is bold and he asks from God what he desires for others. He seeks to bring down upon on one soul or maybe hundreds or thousands the power of the eternal life and all of its blessings. He said it's the power, prayer is the power of being used by God as instruments for his great work of making men and women his habitation and showing forth his glory. The church should seek above everything to cultivate in God's children the power of an unceasing prayerfulness on behalf of this perishing world. I just want you to hear this. Intercession is the means that God uses for the carrying out of his blessed purpose. And so sovereignty of God, I pray because he's sovereign. And I ask because he, he delights to show mercy. That's his glory. We've learned to organize build institutions, publish books, insert ourselves into the media, develop evangelistic strategies and administer discipleship programs. I can't remember who said this, but he said, we've just forgotten how to pray. D.A. Carson, two years ago at a major North American seminary, he had 50 students who had given themselves to overseas ministries to go into missions. And they were interviewed, and he said of those 50, only three had a regular quiet time. How much of our praying has become formulas and cliches? I was always taken back by Charles Spurgeon during his time reading when he got up as a young man and he prayed. There was this little outbreak of revival in the church They said they never heard someone pray that way. All they knew was formal prayers, and he prayed as if he knew God. Are we not better at organizing than agonizing? Better at administering than interceding? Better at fellowship than fasting? Better at entertainment than worship? Better at theological articulation than spiritual adoration? And better at preaching than praying? J.I. Packer said, I believe that prayer is the measure of a man spiritually in a way that nothing else is so that how we pray is as important a question as we can ever face. And so I like that it's dark this morning that you can just sit alone with God and just ask yourself about your prayer life. As a sovereign God established and girded up a prayer life for me, for this advancement, of the kingdom of God. So we need to engage and unceasingly pray for your children and your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, mama, your family, your neighbors, your workmates, any who attend this church, outreach, our missions in Tijuana, North Africa, Spain, Lake City, sister churches. Will, will you pray? That is what God uses as a means to save souls. Would you engage with me to give God no rest day and night, praying for many that he has in this city? I want to be like Christ who ever liveth to make intercession. That's what I get out of Romans 10.1. That's what sovereignty does to my heart. To go pray to a sovereign God that he would save. That's my prayer burden, and I pray that we all bear that. Our second point this morning is in verses 2 through 3. There's a perilous error that we need to avoid then with the gospel. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Why is Paul praying so fervently? Why is his heart so burdened? Here it is, is that this Jewish race, his kinsmen people, they have a zeal for God. They have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. So the positive side is, I testify about them, they do have a zeal for God. They they have zeal, and as I was thinking about zeal, zeal is really neutral. There's a false kind of zeal that you can have. Zeal itself is not necessarily good. The church has kind of made a little God out of it. If you got zeal, you have something. No, you don't. 
okay? Zeal can be good or bad. We, we can have a very misplaced zeal in our text this morning. And I've always gone through that Edwards where you have your mind that stirs up your affections and activates your will that you choose to obey or disobey. That's where zeal is, your will. But true zeal comes from what the mind perceives to be true, and it stirs your affections. And so it, it can't just be we need to muster up more zeal. It's, it's not 75,000 men sitting in a stadium going, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you going back and forth? Today, we're trying every gimmick and game and advertisement to get people zealous for God. The church growth movement now has a bunch of burned out people because they had zeal with no knowledge. What we quit doing was teaching and preaching and laboring over the word of God one verse at a time to understand it. And so we're going to see in our text, zeal is not the measuring line, but truth is. There's a proverb that says, fire is a good servant, but a bad master. <clears throat> Zeal must be a servant to what we know about God and the gospel and what we've learned in Romans. It's a servant to the truth of what we've seen in this book. And get this, it doesn't always look like a guy fired up. Many spring up in Christ's parable and the, and the seed is snatched away, it's scorched by the sun, the thorns choke it out. Zeal is not excitement. That is what the Jews had. They had zeal, and it was even towards Jehovah. Their lives revolved around God and his Torah. They lived in the scriptures. They sought to obey all of its precepts in great detail. This zeal was at the center of their life. They had so much zeal for God and obedience to him, and they missed it. And there are churches all over our country this morning doing the exact same thing. And I pray this morning that no one in this room will do the same thing. Our lands are filled with cults that are praying with beads and wearing ties and riding bikes around, knocking on doors. They're moral. They're family-oriented. They're, they're doing all these things, and they're all going to hell. Zeal is not the mark. It's not the measuring stick. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel about on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Boy, do you have zeal. Paul had this zeal. He said, as far as zeal, I persecuted the church. You name the name of Jesus Christ, and I tried to put you in prison or kill you. I had zeal. As to righteousness in the law, I was found blameless. That's zeal. But all those things that I thought were gaining me acceptance with God, I count now as loss. I count them as manure compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I had a zeal in the law and in Jehovah that was actually leading me away from him. And I want you to hear that this morning. You could be sitting here doing the exact same thing with a zeal doing all the right things and formulas, and it's just leading you away from God because you're trying to do the right things that will get you right with God. But, in verse 2, Allah, on the complete opposite, you do have a zeal for God, but here's why it's wrong. It's not in accordance with knowledge. The Jews had a knowledge of the scriptures. Some of them memorized the whole Pentateuch. They weren't mindless. Paul did not choose the word here, gnosis, in the Greek, which means factual knowledge, pure and simple, but he takes that compound word that we love here at Southside Bible Church, epignosis, epignosis. And that means the, the knowledge that is according to godliness and understanding. It means you get it. When the veil is, is removed and you see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, I'll tell you very clearly, how do I know if I have epignosis? Do you get Romans 10, 4? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe. 
You can be as zealous as you want to be doing everything possible, obeying God's word to get his favor and acceptance, and you don't get it. Your zeal is leading you away from God. It's leading you into a ditch. I pray God brought you here this morning and turned off the lights to let you listen, to examine your heart. Am I using Christianity as a ladder to try to climb to heaven? And is my morality trying to get me accepted with God? And that's been my life. And I'm sitting here frustrated, weary, heavy burden, discouraged. Oh, may you find the answer this morning in verse 4. Paul is praying, God, give the Jews epinosis. They're, they're combing through the word of God and they miss that Jesus said, this word pointed to me. And they're looking at it in detail and they can't see Jesus. And so they're missing him. Paul's praying, God, give him that. And he's preaching him the gospel. And so prayer, if it's sincere, is always attended with effort. We teach, we beg, we plead, we pray, we love. Don't just sit back and say, oh, I pray someone gets saved and I never talk to them. I want to put feet to this heart that Paul had. Charles Spurgeon put it well, of course. He said, oh, that in all our churches we might feel that while effort without prayer is presumption, <clears throat> and prayer without effort is hypocrisy, the holy blending of prayer and labor will produce for certain a grand result. Prayer and labor. In verse 3, Agar, this four now, he's going to explain it. It's going to show what epigenosis they did not have. And so let's look at verse 3. What did they not have in according with knowledge? Let's explain it, Paul says. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And so there's a main verb in this verse. It's that they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They, they wouldn't come under it. The, the Greek word is hupotasso, and it was a military term to rank under. And so you're, you're to come under this truth. Here it is, the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ, and they wouldn't come under it. They're, they're stiff-necked, and they're rebellious, and I, I won't submit to that. No. Why? Because there's a way of salvation in him alone, and we stumbled over him. We would not buy this gospel. We would not believe it. They would not bring themselves under that kind of righteousness, and you're doing the same thing maybe this morning. I won't come under a righteousness that's a gift from God by Jesus Christ. I got to do something. I got to add one little stitch. And that's what they were doing. And they hated this gospel. And Paul gives two participles in this sentence as to why they wouldn't submit to the gospel of righteousness through Jesus Christ alone. Two participles, they were not knowing about God's righteousness and they were seeking to establish their own. For not knowing about God's righteousness, we're back to what's called a subjective genitive. And you'll remember back into Romans 1.17, in this gospel, a better translation is, a God kind of righteousness is revealed. So in this gospel, there's a way to get a God kind of righteousness. And, and, and they weren't getting how righteous God really was. How perfect, without spot, no darkness in him, he dwells in unapproachable light. It's a divine righteousness. God is glorious from within, perfect within and without. He's altogether lovely. And so it's an infinite righteousness. It's a, a perfect divine kind of righteousness that God requires to be in his presence. And that's how they missed it. They're looking at their little light bulbs called keeping the law, and the standard was the sun. And millions and even billions on this earth sit in the same place this morning. Same place not realizing God's righteousness and trying to do their little ditties to feel right with God. The result of this is the next participle. Not knowing how righteous God is and what he requires, you will always seek to establish your own. 
So they knew the law was righteous. They thought, though, it was a human kind of righteousness that they could do. They thought if they could put together this collection of good works, God would approve them. They could satisfy his demands of righteousness by law keeping. And so they missed that the righteousness that God requires of humans is divine righteousness. So the only way it can be obtained then is from God as a free gift. Luke 18, 9, he told a parable to the ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. The result is these Jews are going to die and they're going to come running up to God with these big smiles and they're going to present their righteousness. And Isaiah 64 says it's going to be a filthy rag when they stand before God and see how righteous he really was. And all your good things that you smiled at and felt good about all your days will be a filthy rag before the presence of God. And you're going to see what divine righteousness really looks like. And you'll be cast off into the eternal lake that burns with fire. Do you see why Paul was so burdened? Do you see why they could beat him and whip him, stone him? And say all evil, and he just kept praying and pleading for their salvation. God, let them see it. Let them see it before it's too late. That's a sign of anyone who's received grace. I didn't deserve it. There's others who are going to stand before that God in their own righteousness. Please, God, let them see it. How many are going to come before God on that last day smiling with their church attendance, their moral behavior, the songs that you sang that were Christian, your reading, your music, your tattoo with a biblical phrase on it, your Awana patch, your voting record, your giving, and think that's what righteousness is. But that's what's going to make you right with God And it's going to melt in the face of his awesome glory. And you're going to be naked before God with nothing to clothe you. I tell you this morning, there is only one thing that can clothe you in that that awesome presence. And it's a God kind of righteousness. It's the only thing that can make you stand in his presence blameless with great joy. Amen? Amen. I have an old illustration that I've shared many times, but I'm going to do it again because we've got so many new people. I love this illustration. I heard this story, true story, and it was about a group, I think it was World War II, that they they got caught and they they were living in a a camp, I think in Germany, and someone smuggled in a Monopoly game. And what happened in this camp is they started using the Monopoly money as, as the real source of money in that camp. So if you got enough money, you could buy cigarettes with it, you could get favors, all these things you would use the money for. And, and there's always a Taylor Murphy in every group. And this one guy ended up with all the money by the time they got out. <laughs> and when they got out, he comes walking back in America and he walks up to the bank smiling and says, I'd like to make a deposit. And he said, I'd like to deposit $17 million dollars. And then he handed him the Monopoly money. And the lady laughed, said, I'm sorry, that's not worth anything. And I, but in his camp, it really was worth something. And in our little churches, our little morality and our righteousness, it's really worth something. People applaud it and are proud of you. But when you come before this God, you're going to be realizing your Monopoly money was filthy rags. All that righteousness that you were proud of as a filthy rag before God, and it will accomplish nothing. So what we need is epinosis. I need to get this. And I need to get epinosis in this precious truth of our third point. The precious truth that we need to embrace. I got bad news. I cannot see the clock. (laughs) So just get comfortable, man. This is the whole Bible in one verse. Thank you, Jesus. Precious truth we must embrace for Christ 
is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's epinosis. The law was given by Moses. It manifested the righteousness of God. It was never intended to save, but it was what God required of us. Galatians 3.10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. It's a book of condemnation. It brought guilt, shame. It made it transgression now against God. It demanded a righteousness that we couldn't give. Spurgeon again said, yet a strange infatuation. Like the fascination which attracts a gnat to the candle, which burns its wings. Men by nature fly to the law for salvation and cannot be driven from it. I'll, I'll yell at you, scream, use verses, and you will not leave the law. He's just saying you just keep going to it. Light, light, light. The law can do nothing else but reveal sin and pronounce condemnation upon the sinner. And yet we can't get men away from it. Even though we show them how sweetly Jesus stands between them and it, they prefer Sinai to Calvary. It's the fall. So the Jews thought they were the end of the law for righteousness. And the problem is the law demanded a divine righteousness that could not come from fallen humans. And so a human could labor under this law for all, all of eternity and only produce human righteousness. That's the best you're ever going to get. And so we didn't need another Adam. He just would have blown it. We needed Jesus Christ to be born under the law, to come in as perfect humanity and perfect deity joined into one, the fountain of every blessing. And so he was born of a woman, Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit under the law, and he was subject to its demands. But the God-man fulfilled all righteousness. He satisfied every jot and tittle of requirement because in its essence, what it required is, is righteousness, and Jesus was that in the very essence of who he is. He came and he gave a divine obedience to the divine righteous law and he carried out its demands. And what he did is he ushered in a true righteousness. Are you sure? He hung on a cross and he said, it's finished, all righteousness. And he died and he was raised on the third day in victory, now seated at the right hand of God. Christ is the end of law for righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A lot of debate. What is the end of the law? And as I've looked at a lot of the different views, I think I get what the struggle is, is Christ is it. I mean, if you just look at redemptive history, it could be referring to that, that that God makes a promise to Abraham, I'm going to bless you by faith. He believes God. It's reckoned to him as righteousness. 400 years later, the law is given to show transgression, to show you your need of Christ, to picture Christ, to portray Christ. Christ comes in. When he dies, the veil's torn in two. Law is finished. Mosaic covenant is over. And so for the end of the law, for righteousness, I get it in Jesus Christ, and now it's Christ instead of tablets of stone. He's it now in my heart, my acceptance, my righteousness. He's it. He's also it because I, I came into that, that redemptive storyline, and I started trying to give an, a, a divine righteousness to the law, and I couldn't. And so he was the end of me trying for years and years to clean up and be good enough. And finally, the light comes on. Jesus Christ did it all. Thank you. And it's not by law, it's by faith. I quit trying to do it all, and I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness. He's provided it. 
what we need to stand before God. He'll wrap you this morning in his garment of righteousness. We don't offer one thread to this garment. It's a divine, perfect garment. By grace through faith, we're wrapped in it, and we're clothed in divine righteous positionally. Christ is the end of the law. I love the prepositional phrase, ace unto righteousness. We've said it before. It's like a circle being brought into the middle. I'm just plunged into infinite righteousness. The, the, the trail stops at Christ. Do you really understand what this means? I've been wrestling you for decades, some of you. Have you died to the law and your performance and your work and your doing to get the acceptance of God this morning as justification? Are you still stuck in that? And every time you look and see that you're coming short, oh, I'm not a Christian. And you just keep looking at your own righteousness for your acceptance with God. I just, on this ground this morning, I just want you to finally lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet, stand in Him gloriously complete. He's fulfilled it. Come to Christ. Look to Him. The Jews labored under this law trying to muster it up. They were trying to do things to get right with God when before them, before them was the one, Jesus, who offered them divine righteousness. The one that the law pointed to in types and shadows and laws. And he comes and says, I'll give you righteousness without cost, without money, without labor. And they looked at him and they hated him because he exposed what they really were. And he showed them what their human righteousness looked like to divine righteousness. So they nailed him up to a cross and they stumbled over the stumbling stone. There's a new way in Romans 3.21 to get righteousness. And it's by faith in Jesus Christ. Joel read it this morning. That I, 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 to, to have a righteousness now that, that comes by faith and not by law. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Present tense participle to everyone who's a believing one. And you finally get epinosis and you quit looking to human righteousness to try to get yourself right with God and clean yourself up and get his favor. When you finally die and look and see Jesus came and fulfilled it all, And now by faith, God gives that to me. That's epinosis. And when you believe that, it becomes everything. It's the center of your life. It's your hope. It's your dream. It's your pursuits, your ambitions. It's just not, oh, I got this in my head. Epinosis is you get this. Here's my life, my soul, my all. That's what happens when you understand what's happened in Jesus Christ. And so I pray that everyone in here will be a believing one in Jesus Christ, who's altogether lovely. Christ alone. Epinosis. This is what Paul was praying for. This is subjecting yourself to God's righteousness. The gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Amen? Okay, I can see the clock, so I owe you four points of application. I'll just throw them out there. Parenting will come back again. But don't teach them um, that they get right by what they do, but they do right because they are right with God. You use, use the word properly. I guess, do you have epinosis? To really do a good examination, is this more than just factual data? You see him as a treasure hidden in a field, willing to give up all. Has it produced a zeal for the things of God? Jesus said, a zeal for my Father's house will consume me. This is a true zeal that comes from epinosis and getting this gospel. And now I have a zeal for this beautiful truth.
It's my life. And are your loved ones and the lost being bathed in prayer? Will you walk away this morning with a renewed commitment to pray for the lost? Let it be revived this morning in this word to be praying and interceding for souls. People you know, people you don't know, Ukraine. Just pray for souls and harvest and gospel and salvation. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful morning that you have planned for us. Thank you for a time to just slow down, turn off the lights, and stare at the light of the world. The one who is the end of the law for righteousness to all who will believe. The aroma of Jesus Christ shines brightly. He is what everything has been reaching and pointing to. He is the only way to ever be acceptable to you, O oh God. It's through a perfect righteousness that he came and gave. And for all of our unrighteousness, he went up on a cross and he died in our place so that we could be forgiven. God, I thank you for this glorious gospel. Let it be epinosis in every heart this morning. God, use it and light our hearts on fire to pray for this and labor for this kingdom until we die. This message is too good to be the best kept secret. God, let us enter into lives and love them and sow this and pray for them and model it. God, let us be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.